give me a warm welcome for Mr. Andrew Keane. This is definitely the weirdest thing I've ever done. Can you all hear me? You're supposed to have laughed when I said that was the weirdest thing I've ever done. This is the weirdest thing. It's like the internet. It sounds like I'm all speaking to you personally, right? So there's a kind of... It's a false intimacy because, of course, I'm not. Some of you may be hearing different messages. And I hear from my friend Michael at the front that if I say something really offensive, you'll all switch over to orange or green and go and listen to somebody else. So it's nice to be here. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the problems with the digital revolution so far and then talk about some solutions that I uh, take from my new book, How to Fix the Future. It's nice to be here. This is a kind of, a, a, I guess, I'm not sure if this is a, a surreal or a weird environment or something um, that's now the new normal. Uh, I hear, for, again, from my friend Michael at the front that the, the tagline for this show is, there's no normal. Um, no normal being that apparently upstairs, that's where the grown-ups are in the finance industry. Th that's, those are the bankers and the traditional financial executives and institutions. And downstairs, the hackers and the, the people with the blue headsets on and uh, the programmers, um, you are the guys disrupting. You're the hackers. You're the ones who are bringing the old institutions down. So um, no normal means that in your industry, in finance, uh, in the money business, um, everything is being disrupted. Uh, of course, that's not unusual in every industry now, um, throughout, throughout the world. Every industry now is being radically disrupted by the digital revolution. First, it was media, which I lived through in the 90s. I had an, uh, an internet startup called Audio Cafe, which was a music startup. Um, now it's finance. Now it's transportation. Now it's healthcare. Now it's government. Now it's infrastructure. A few weeks ago, I spoke at a, an infrastructure event um, in Berlin. Every industry, hospitality, every industry is being radically disrupted by, by this new technology. First by the internet, now by new, even more radically disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence and blockchain. So I remember, um, I remember what this felt like. Uh, you know, some, uh, some of you are my age, some of you look a little bit younger, some of you, how many people, as a matter of interest, how many of you are, you can stick up your hand, how many of you are entrepreneurs? How many of you are in startups? None of you? What does that say about Germany? Um, how many of you work for traditional companies? Oh my God. How many of you are unemployed? How many of you want to be in startups? Okay, so most of you still work in traditional institutions, which again in the, in the finance industry, of course, is probably not that unusual because there aren't as many startups in FinTech. But I remember back in the 90s when I was younger, less gray, and I was really excited by all this disruption, too, in the media business. I was a young music entrepreneur. I'd been a journalist, and I got the internet bug in the 1990s. I was lucky enough to be in San Francisco. And it was incredibly exciting. It was an amazing time to be um, in the media business in the mid-90s. This, remember, in the mid-90s, this was just as Amazon was starting. This was before Google existed, before Facebook. This was... Um, uh, the, the, the beginnings of what we might think of as the Internet 1.0 revolution. And it was exciting, of course, because we all thought we were going to become... No one ever thought they were going to become billionaires back then. We didn't even know what a billionaire looked like. Um, but we all thought we were going to get very rich. But we also thought we were doing good stuff. We thought that this revolution would change the world for the better. We thought, you know, in, in, in terms of the old media industry, the the big music record labels, we thought they were bad, that they controlled the distribution of content. We thought that there was a tiny group of artists who, um, who, who, who controlled the audience. We thought that there were lots of unemployed or um, unsigned creative musicians, filmmakers, writers, all of whom could benefit from this new radically disruptive technology. It was distributive. There was no center. It wasn't the top-down technology of 
the industrial age. So we thought that it would create more of a level playing field. We thought it would create jobs. We were all in the business of doing startups, and back then you needed 50 people to build a website. Back then uh, everyone wanted to be a web developer. Um, we thought that it would be good for culture. We thought that all this technology would allow people to talk to one another more openly. That people in Japan and Korea could talk to people in China, and people in China could talk to people in the West. People in the United States could talk to people in Africa. That there'd be a kind of mutual understanding, a, a new kind of enlightenment. So culturally, we were really excited. And we were all excited on the business side. We are excited with new business models, particularly with the beginnings of Web 2.0, we thought, wow, you could give products out for free like Google or Facebook. No one would have to pay for products, and yet everyone would use these products, and, and even the Google and the Facebook guys, they would get really rich. So it seemed like magic. It seemed like a win-win for everybody, for consumer, for entrepreneur, for the economy, for society, for culture. Now, as uh, the gentleman who introduced me uh, suggested, I've become a critic. I wasn't originally. But I have become a critic of what's happened because though that, that belief, the idea that technology could make the world a better place, that it would level the playing field for everyone, that it would create jobs, that it would enrich culture, that it could create new exciting business models that work better for everyone, that I think over the last 25 years has been disproved. Today in 2018, um, almost you know, 25 years after I began as an entrepreneur, the media business, the media landscape looks not like something that isn't normal, but actually exactly as normal as ever. If anything, it's, it's uber normal. Because when you look at today's media industry, it's controlled by a tiny group of companies. The Facebooks, the Googles, the Amazons, the Apples, these are the new monopolists. These are the companies that dominate. Um, the old media industry, the newspapers, the record labels, they've been decimated. The, record, the, the recorded music industry, for example, was cut by 50%, the global revenue of, of, of music sales between 1999, when Napster was founded, and, and about two years ago. Uh, the newspapers are shutting all over the world. So what you have is an increasing monopolization. The level, the playing field is anything but level. Uh, we have increasingly, as a consequence of the digital revolution, a winner-take-all economy. A winner-take-all economy which is reflected in profound inequalities. In Europe, of course, you see it, most of the companies here, the companies that are idealizing open source, whatever open source means, I never really understand it, but the companies that are idealizing open source, these are multi-billion, sometimes trillion dollar companies. Um, and of course, in economic terms, the inequalities are increasingly stark. The nine wealthiest billionaires, multi-billionaires, imagine that. Back in the mid-90s, we couldn't even imagine what a, a billionaire looked like. Today, most of the leading internet entrepreneurs are multi-billionaires. Jeff Bezos is not only the richest man in the world at about $150 billion, but is the richest man in the history of the world. If you put the nine wealthiest multi-billionaires of Silicon Valley together, their wealth collectively is worth about the same amount as the poorest two and a half billion people on Earth. So what we're seeing then is not no normal, but the new normal. We're seeing the, the contours, the inequalities, the injustices of the industrial economy being replayed on an uber scale in the digital economy. The digital revolution is changing everything, there's no doubt about that. It's an amazing event in historical terms. It's as profound, as disruptive, as consequential as the industrial revolution of the 19th century. But like the Industrial Revolution, it's not resulting in justice, it's resulting in injustice. The same is true on the jobs front. We were promised lots of jobs, but AI, the technology that's now supposedly powering your revolution, Michael says that blockchain isn't as relevant for your community. I think blockchain's an interesting technology, but certainly AI is now uh, the, 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 the motor of the revolution. AI, of course, as, as my introducer said, that's going to make us unemployed because it's replicating us. I don't know what all you guys do, whether you, you know, in the old days you worked in banks. 
Now, I, the last time I went to the bank was probably in about 2001. You don't need to because of ATMs. But the kind of labor that's being employed in the financial industry, which historically had been employed standing behind the till and giving people money and checking their balances, the very human labor now is being replicated by AI, and we see that across the board. We see it, of course, with the car industry. We're seeing it with self-driving cars in the US. I think 20 or 25 percent of, of men who are employed are in the driving business. Well, in 25 years, it will probably be 1 or 2 percent. This is the new peasantry in the Industrial Revolution. They're being made redundant. AI is not only making menial labor redundant, but increasingly sophisticated, trained labor. The professions of the industrial age, law, medicine, teaching, maybe even public speaking and writing, they are being profoundly, again, using this, this, this euphemism uh, disruption, which is a, a polite word for saying being destroyed, we could use more impolite words than that, uh, AI is replacing lawyers, it's replacing doctors, it's replacing academics, it's replacing engineers, it's replacing programmers. Um, so in terms of employment, many economists forecast that 40 or 50 percent of our jobs, our traditional industrial jobs, are going to be replaced over the next 10 or 15 years. The reality is nobody really knows. Any economist who stands on stage I say, and says, I know that AI will do this or that to the employment, uh, to the future of employment, are, are, are being dishonest. It's, it's very speculative. but. The vast majority of serious economists are worried. I talked to a guy called Jeffrey Sachs, one of the most influential economists in the US. He, taught at Harvard, uh, he teaches at Columbia University. Uh, he's, he's the kind of guy who usually wins Nobel Prizes and that sort of thing. And he says that most economists acknowledge, not only that they don't know, but most of them are pessimistic. So on the job front, this technology is worrying. On the job front, it's replacing us. On the job front, it means that we, as a species, the people who have invented AI, we're the ones who are scratching around for a role. What are we going to do? What are we going to do when you have smart machines, smart networks that do everything at a, fra sorry, at a fraction of the cost that it, it, it requires to employ actual people, pay their pensions and their health care, make sure that they have housing? On the cultural front, of course, we know that, um, that the digital revolution has been a catastrophe. We've seen it with this terrible influx of fake news, the undermining of democracy. We see it on the internet. The internet was supposed to enlighten. It was supposed to make us into better people. But now when we go online, what do we see? Mostly hatred against immigrants, against women threats of violence, hostility, an echo chamber culture. We have a kind of growth of narcissism on the internet where social media that was supposed to, at least according to Mark Zuckerberg, was supposed to make us more social, more communal, more collective, more global. The reverse is true because of so social media, as I argue in my 20, as I argued in my 2012 book, Digital Vertigo, social media is driving us into ourselves. It's personalized. It's not really social. When we go on Facebook, we're shaping our own communities. It's a giant mirror. And of course, it's creating an, an, an infestation, perhaps even a plague of narcissism. We love ourselves. The internet is this giant mirror. We look at it and we see ourselves and we glow in the glory of it, whether it's on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. People used to talk about, um, Jeff Bezos, uh, sorry, people used to talk about Barack Obama as the first internet president uh, because he used digital media marketing to, to win the election. But the reality, of course, is that the first internet president is Donald Trump, not because he knows how to use digital. Any politician now has to know how to use digital, not because he understands AI or blockchain or any of these new technologies, because he is a supreme narcissist. He loves himself. And when 
Trump looks into the world, he looks into a mirror. And his only understanding of the world is according to his own interests. He views it in entirely subjective terms and in entirely personal terms. So Trump is the first digital president in a cultural sense. And of course, that cultural world now is being seen by the rise of populism, our failure to be able to talk to one another, even in Germany, which in my view is the most civilized and best run country in the world. It's our best hope from the Western point of view of shaping um, uh, uh, a, a working society in the 21st century, even in Germany, uh, even with your terrible, catastrophic, tra tra uh, catastrophically tragic history, you have the rise of the new right, of populism, of hatred of immigrants. It's all bound up with digital. So culturally, things aren't good either. And finally, on the business model front, that win-win, of course, has turned out to be a huge loss for all of us because it's become increasingly clear, especially over the last few years, that the, the free economy is anything but free. These new trillion dollar Goliaths, these Silicon Valley companies, they give us their stuff for free. We all use Facebook, we all use Google. I, I'm not on Facebook, but I am on Google. And I use it a hundred times an hour, let alone a day. I'm absolutely dependent on it. It's entirely free, but of course it isn't free because every time I use it, Google knows more about me. Every time we use Facebook, that personalization, this ideal form of the internet is actually one in which we are being turned into the product. We are being exploited. We are being mined, our inner, selves, the essence of democracy and freedom and individualism, what distinguishes me from you and you from your neighbor, what goes on in your, inside, your, your choices, your consumer habits, your sexuality, your travel, your vision, your dreams, your nightmares, these are all increasingly being datafied, they're being collected by these giants, and they are making huge multi-billion, as I said, trillion dollar businesses out of it. So these business models work from the point of view of Silicon Valley Goliaths, but they don't work from the point of view of you and I, because we have been turned into products. So the digital revolution so far, it hasn't worked. It's worked for a few technologists. It's worked in the sense that we all carry these supercomputers around with us, and they are amazing. I mean, I, I couldn't live without this. It even keeps time so that I, I won't go over 30 minutes. But we still need to fix the future. So how do we do it in 2018? How can we start again? I think Germany is a good place to talk about this because Germans have always been very good at re-engineering things. Your history in the Industrial Age, of course, is that Germany wasn't the, um, the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, which was in England, particularly in Manchester. But the Germans figured out ways of improving on the English and American Industrial Revolutions. And actually, by the end of the 19th, early 20th century, had become the leading industrial state. Now, we all know German history didn't quite work out I, as intended, but I think these days Germany can become a model for re-engineering, if you like, digital capitalism, re-engineering the potential, because clearly this technology has amazing potential. I'm anything but a Luddite. I don't want to destroy these things. I couldn't live without them, and most of us couldn't. And the future still could be really exciting. So how do we fix the future? Uh, as the gentleman who introduced me, I think the thing that we need to bear in mind most of all is agency, human agency. We need to figure out a place for us in this revolution. And we begin with a theme of agency. We begin here because this is where we need to carve out our role. Our history as a species always is that we break the future and then we fix it. But this time, the stakes are particularly high because if we don't fix it, we may become a footnote. We may become the very victims of artificial intelligence. We, art, AI, as somebody said in a famous book, uh, AI might be our final invention. So in my book, I invent a term which I call Moore's Law. Now you all know Moore's Law as the law of Gordon Moore, the co-founder of Intel, who came up with his idea that computer chips will double in their power every 18 months, which has driven the revolution, which enables AI, which 
which drives, which is the motor of, of excusing the, 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 the automotive pun, but is the motor of the revolution. And it will continue probably for 20 or 30 years. And even with quantum computing and technology, it may even continue for longer than that. But I come up with another kind of Moore's law. My Moore's law is taken from uh, a 16th century book written by an Englishman called Thomas More, called Utopia. Now, I don't know how many of you have read Utopia. It's well worth reading. It's, it was written 500 years ago, but it's still incredibly relevant today. In Utopia, Moore invented the word Utopia, a word now that has entered common parlance. We all use it. Moore was anything but a utopian. He reminded us that we have the power. Moore was a humanist. And he reminded us that we have not only the power, but the responsibility to make the world a better place. And Moore's great enemy was Martin Luther. Martin Luther believed as the first, as, as the sort of leading figure in Protestantism, he believed in predestination. He didn't believe we had power. He believed that there was something greater. We need to go back to Moore, to Moore's law and that kind of humanism to remind ourselves of what our power can be. Our power, what distinguishes us from the algorithm is that we can be creative, that we have agency, that we can think for ourselves. Whatever one says about AI, it can't think for itself. It needs to be programmed. The goals created for AI are the goals that will, um, these are the goals created by human beings. So Moore's law reminds us that being human means having agency, particularly in the age of AI. Now that's not enough, that's a kind of metal level. In my book I talk about five areas where we, where we need to display agency collectively if we are to build a better future, if this second or third wave of digital innovation the AI, the blockchain revolution, the finance, the fintech revolution, whatever you call it, if this is going to be more successful than the first two, if it's not going to result in more monopolies, more inequality, more cultural decay, more consumer exploitation. I think the first thing to bear in mind here is regulation matters. That's good for you guys. It's good for the financial industry. The financial industry has always, always worked within the context of regulation. We're seeing a much more regulatory digital economy in media. We're seeing the way in which these monopolists now are being investigated in Europe by antitrust uh, investigations from the EU. We're seeing the way in which Facebook is now being forced to be accountable. We're seeing the way in which Apple is being forced by the EU to pay taxes. We're seeing the way in which the EU is championing data regulation, the general data reg uh, GDPR, which is protecting consumers. This is really important, and this is something that Europe, I think, should be really proud of. You guys are pioneering a new kind of regulatory digital economy. It happened in the, in the Industrial Revolution, and it will happen in the Digital Revolution. Indeed, the Industrial Revolution is a guide, but regulation isn't sufficient. When I give speeches about this in Silicon Valley, people always look at me when I talk about regulation and say, oh, he's just another guy from the government. He wants to destroy innovation. I don't want to do that, but regulation is important. And as I suggest in the book, I, I spent some time with Margaret Vestager, the EU commissioner of antitrust. Her goal as a regulator is to create a level playing field. It's not to undermine innovation. So the best regulators, the most responsible regulators, are creating a level playing field, are enabling entrepreneurs, are enabling the market, are enabling commerce. We need innovation too, but we need a new kind of innovation. I think the next wave of entrepreneurs need to be much more realistic. They need to be much more honest about the kinds of products they're producing. So in fintech, for example, when you create products for consumers, Force them to pay. They need to pay. Make sure that this, these products are accountable and truly transparent. 
you know, Facebook and Google say, oh, our products are transparent, they're anything but transparent. We still have no idea of how they collect our data and what they do with our data. This next wave of innovation needs to be more honest with consumers because consumers are waking up and you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility as innovators to create products which are actually designed for human beings and not to be exploitative. So innovation matters, but not just move fast and break things as Mark Zuckerberg says. Move far, sure, but don't break things, or at least don't break consumers. Build products that are really responsible. Look at this car, beautiful car. The German car industry is a world leader. Back in the 1950s, the American car industry was completely dominant. And then the American industry, like, in the, like today, the American industry became fat, lazy, and arrogant. They began to create, uh, they began to create cars that were essentially death traps. Uh, in 1965, Ralph Nader, a very famous uh, American consumer activist, wrote a book called Unsafe at Any Speed. It revealed how dangerous American cars were. It revealed that the products weren't designed really for consumers. What's interesting about the history of the American car industry is after Nader's book and the huge storm it created, the American car industry felt it fell into a crisis which it still hasn't really recovered from, even with Tesla. It allowed the rise of the German car industry, a car industry and the Japanese car industries, cars designed with safety in mind. Now, I'm not sure how safe that car looks. Uh, maybe BMW can give me one and I'll test it. But um, what's interesting is that the German car industry or the success of the German car industry is based on safety, is based on putting the consumer first. That needs to be the role of the entrepreneur. And that's why I think next wave digital entrepreneurs from Europe have a huge opportunity because most American companies and innovators, I think, haven't put the consumers first. So you need innovation, you need regulation, but we also see, need to see consumers more aggressive, more empowered. Do I have five more minutes? Yeah, very briefly. We need consumer empowerment. We need consumers to be more demanding. Delete Facebook. Demand to know where your data is. It's not enough just to rely on regulation. It's not enough just to rely on new innovation. So innovation, regulation, consumer power, citizens, of course, have to step forward, whether they're teachers or lawyers. We all need to fight for a better digital future. In the middle of the 19th century, 11-year-olds worked in factories. Cities were uninhabitable. Now, the literal consequences of the digital revolution are less troubling. But at the same time, we're all troubled by the destruction of privacy and the inequality and the injustices of the digital age. We can all do something. So citizens matter, the purest manifestation of Moore's law. And finally, education is really important. We need to educate people for this new age. They need to fill the vacuum of being human in the, in the digital age. As I said, the one thing that the algorithm can't do is think for itself. The algorithm can't be creative. The algorithm can't be empathetic. Those human qualities are the things that will allow us to thrive or to continue to thrive as, if you like, the dominant species over technology in the 21st century. But these are not things that are being taught in the schools. So in my final chapter in my book, How to Fix the Future, I look at innovative education establishments, the Waldorf system in particular, which, again, surprise, surprise, was actually created after the First World War by um, a German in Austria, uh, which focuses on teaching creativity, teaching agency. So education, consumer power, citizen engagement, innovation and regulation. Now, these things aren't going to happen overnight. There's no app to fix the future. It's not going to happen with a new company or a new technology. It's going to take generations, just as the digital revolution, just as the industrial revolution took generations to work itself out. And we know that the history of the industrial revolution was catastrophic in the wars around fascism, Nazism and communism were themselves kind of consequences of the industrial revolution. 
The 21st century is the digital century, just as the 19th and 20th centuries were the industrial centuries. We have much to work on, but we have the opportunity now to begin to fix the future. We have to address this stuff now. This is the time where we can begin to shape a better world. And it's not up to me, it's not up to regulators, it's not up to Jeff Bezos or the Google guys, it's up to all of you. The future, as always in the history of, of, of our species, the future is about us. We are the ones who are not only responsible, but accountable for building a better world. So, thank you.